This is part 2 of Born Into Rage. Please watch part 1 on this channel first. Tell me about the knives. Where did you get them? From the drawer. What kind of knives? Um, big shot. And what do you want to do with those knives? Kill John and Mommy with them and Daddy. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Das is back on the show on The Disturbing Truth from a site for sore minds. If you haven't seen his YouTube channel, you simply must check it out. Some of the best, most informative uh, uh, content you can find that deals with the same stuff that we deal with on this channel. And even though Dr. Das and I share different opinions when it comes to releasing individuals that I would call monsters, it doesn't matter. I still think that I can learn a lot from him. His experience is valuable to me. Dr. Das, good to see you again, mate. Oh man, you give me such a good intro. Thank you. Just that was off the top of the dome, by the way. It was just <laughs> freestyling. Freestyling, yeah. Um, I emailed you recently about uh, a girl named Beth Thomas, and that's what we've been talking about today in this video. Uh, pardon me, you may see me sweating today. I've just finished training with my friend Mathers, which most of you know, and uh, I just don't cool down that that quick. I'm a big fat guy, so. Um, but I'm working on it. But anyway, uh, Beth Thomas, this little girl was, um, incorrectly assumed to be a psycho psychopathic child, but she's not, is she? She suffers from something called RAD or reactive attachment disorder. And I just thought you were the man to tell me more about that. And yeah, please, please fill me in on how something like this could happen. Yeah. So obviously really horrific case so you can't really imagine somebody having a worse start in life right so yeah uh, as i'm sure you've, you've talked about in your other videos mother died when she was one years old father neglected her barely fed her physically sexually abused her just literally everything that could possibly go wrong in her childhood did so to answer your question there's not there's not really such thing as a baby psychopath or a psychopathic baby or even child because for the simple fact that psychopathy is a personality disorder and your personality is not fully developed or not fully finished until you're at least an adult and in fact i think this is a perfect example of that the very fact that she did eventually manage to change some of her personality traits so your typical psychopath is somebody who is aggressive, callous, uh, impulsive, but most importantly, they're really, really manipulative and deceitful. And I think that Beth, especially in her earlier years, would uh, would fit into more comfortably into a diagnosis of, as you say, reactive attachment disorder. So there is definitely some overlap, so I can see why some people would make that mistake. I suppose the way that I look at reactive attachment disorder is, is a child who's not yet learnt uh, any kind of emotional, uh, uh, emotional maturity. So they've not really understood what love is, what comfort is, because they've never experienced it. So they can present in many different ways. So a psychopath, generally speaking, is roughly the same as another psychopath. You know, they might have some traits to a higher degree and some traits to a lesser degree, but they have roughly the same traits. Whereas RAD, you can have a whole range of traits and they're quite different and they're quite inconsistent and it can change over time. So it could be that that child is relatively calm and settled, but has no ability to form any kind of connection. So if they're adopted, say, or if there's a caregiver, they're kind of indifferent to that caregiver. Uh, or they can just seem to lack all kinds of warmth or emotion at all. So if you give them a toy, they might be slightly interested in it, but they don't really care. They're not that happy compared to a normal child who's had, a, uh, who's had the ability to, to internalize normal emotions. And they tend to be kind of indifferent to people around them, other children around them and adults and caregivers. And they can, like Beth Thomas was, be also very, very aggressive, especially if they were the victim of violence as opposed to being the victim of just neglect. So hopefully that paints a picture of how there's a big overlap with the two completely distinct disorders. The children in this old film are being videoed as a part of a study that aimed to examine the effects of maternal deprivation on young children. The kids selected for the study are children who had been in a system that saw them going from home to home making zero positive social connections, never really attaching themselves to anyone or anything. Most of these children have endured a withdrawn life for so long that it dealt severe injury to the child's ability to establish affectionate relationships, sometimes even leaving the innocent kid with deep wounds that may never fully be repaired. 
After all, how can you repair something that never existed? The lack of stable relationships coupled with constant recurring separation leaves these young lives looping in a state of both rejection and self-induced isolation. Okay, so um, in Beth's case, uh, while she shared, you know, these these psychopathic traits with, you know, an adult that may be considered psychopathic, she you wouldn't consider her psychopathic. But could that, without proper help and care, could that have evolved or devolved? I don't know what way to kind of say it. Could that have turned into uh, an adult that would be psychopathic? Yeah, absolutely. So it already damaged her to a, a very significant degree. And we see that by the very fact that even after she was adopted, these behaviors continued. So even though she had, you know, much more supportive, loving parents, she still had these um, personality traits. So it almost took her a while to unlearn all the horrific abuse that she would have picked up and modeled from her father and then to relearn what is a normal human uh, reaction what is a normal human relationship how do you express warmth affection love so those things because she was in a more conducive environment plus the therapy i think is it was another big part she relearned uh, normal human behavior that had she continued in such an environment or other patients that I've certainly seen uh, who've ended up you know, in the criminal justice system who have just had a horrific background that didn't relent, that continued uh, to face physical and sexual and emotional abuse. Absolutely, that's, that's the exact conditions that will grow a psychopath. Okay, yeah, interesting. And, and would it be safe to say that Beth at the time, um, in place of what should have been love, care, empathy, um, sympathy, even uh, would it be would it be fair to say that in place of those things, she she learned hate, aggression, um, violence, really, uh, sexual uh, promiscuity. I, I I I guess is how you might characterize it. Is it safe to say that where love and care would have been, those things were replacing it at the time? Yeah, absolutely. So children, especially younger children, they tend to emulate or model the behavior that they see from caregivers, from parents, sometimes to a lesser degree, even from siblings. So it's a very well known fact, completely separate to reactive attachment disorder, completely separate to psychopathy. In fact, completely separate to psychiatric diagnoses. It's just a well known fact that people who are victims of both physical and sexual abuse, uh, there's uh, not all of them by any means, but there's an increased risk that they commit those behaviors. And part of that is just modeling. So literally a kid does or copies what his what his mother or father does and part of it's because they think that is normal so they think that violence is a normal way of conflict resolution if somebody's got a different opinion to me or if i want something different something to eat or uh, you know i want to watch something different t uh, something different on tv i will do what dad did to me when he got angry so he used his fists so i'll use my fists and in a similar way uh, people uh, children who go through a lot of sexual abuse especially prolonged uh, repeated sexual abuse tend to, to become promiscuous as you say and that's because it's nothing to do with the uh, uh, morality it's because they see overt sex as a normal way of showing affection you know especially if it suffered it from their parents they, they think that's the natural way of how you show somebody that you have feelings for them. beth basically couldn't you know she couldn't understand why she wasn't allowed to kill her brother and stick pins in the dogs and and murder people this it seemed to me at one point that it was almost like this game that beth was playing to win you know um she just didn't seem to understand why can't I do this? Why, why can't I be? Uh, I suppose she didn't know what evil is. And is it evil if it's all she ever knew? You know? I, I would argue that it's not evil, especially in the earlier years before she actually was, was old enough and mature enough to make her own moral guidance and compass. So, you know, we've got kids. I know you've got, you've got kids as well. Part of being a parent is setting boundaries, is telling them off. So if your yeah. kid's, you know, shouting or... Uh, throwing food around the cafe a good parent will tell that kid that that's unacceptable over and over again and they eventually learn uh, not only their moral <clears throat> not only their sort of the boundaries of morality but also the boundaries of acceptable human behavior it's not acceptable to swear it's not acceptable to shout it's not acceptable to throw a tantrum i'm sure we, i'm sure we've all seen parents i know I, I certainly have who are not particularly good at that and they seem to have these bratty kids <laughs> This little boy was lost at a Chuck E. Cheese in New York. 
He continuously behaves horribly and no one seems willing to stop him. He spits, he kicks, he roars, he takes, all without fear of consequence. The fact that the adults in this scenario did so little to restrain the kid and take control of the situation is appalling. Just like the fact that someone thought the correct response to this other little boy's shopping cart tantrum was to reward him with candy. Do not make this mistake with your children. It's crucial to their early development. So it's like an extrapolation of that. She's never been told no. She's never been told that she couldn't push her brother or hit her brother. And in fact, probably witnessed her father do exactly that. So mm. when she's very young, she's incapable of knowing what's right and wrong. It's only roughly around the age of seven onwards that people even have, uh, children even have the concept of good behavior versus bad behavior. Well, this is kind of, uh, this kind of segues into the reason that I decided to cover this case. Um, I just finished a story about Ricky Neve. Um, I'm sure you've heard of Ricky Neve. Uh, I've heard the name. I don't know many details, I'm afraid. You know, uh, me a very way. famous case. He was a six-year-old boy, again, uh, who uh, was found dead. They thought it was the mom, Ruth Neve. She was tried, found innocent, but guilty of heavy neglect and abuse. Uh, it turned out to be... Uh, another teenager in the area that, that committed the crime. And we're talking about a case that I think was like in 1994. So, you know, they just caught him, they just sentenced him. But what was really interesting about that case was that after I posted the video, I had an interview with Rochelle Neve, which would have been Ricky's little sister. Now, at the time, she would have been like between the ages of two or three. And she claims that she remembers the abuse that was done to her and Ricky and has some very specific traumatic memories that she brought up. Once I posted the interview, I had a lot of people saying, how the hell could she remember something that happened whenever she was three? And that kind of inspired me to make this video, this, this video um, because I also suffered some uh, child abuse at the hands of a babysitter when I was around two, and I remember it. So uh, I kind of had to hold back with feeling like, you know, people saying this was a personal attack. Um, and I thought, no, let's just, it reminded me of Beth Thomas immediately. And I thought, well, let's just do a video where we talk about this and how it, how it does affect kids. Children do not fully develop a sense of self until typically around one and a half or two years of age. Having a sense of self, the I separate from others, gives a place for memory to be organized and develop personal meaning. Kids begin forming explicit childhood memories around the two-year mark, but the majority are still implicit memories until they're about seven. It's what researchers like Dr. Carol Peterson from Canada's Memorial University of Newfoundland call childhood amnesia. Implicit memories are memories that a child may not recall, but they mold behaviors and have a lifelong effect. Think of this as emotional recollection, but explicit memories, on the other hand, require actual conscious recall. I know personally that kids can remember things. It, well, for me specifically, it, it was the trauma that I remember. Yes, most certainly kids can remember stuff at two and three. For Beth, she was one to one and a half. And then she was going on to draw pictures about what happened to her. So this idea that, oh, she was too young, she couldn't possibly remember remember that, that that's false, isn't it? Or Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So firstly, I'm really sorry to hear what you've been through, Justin. I had, I had no idea. That's, um, yeah, ah, I'm really sorry. Um, to answer your question, yes, absolutely. So I think what people sometimes mix up is that the usually children can't form vivid memories, like vivid visual memories, until they're around usually about four, sometimes towards the end of three. But that's what that's what's typical. There is that you know everything's on a spectrum. So there are definitely kids that can remember later, and there are kids that can't remember anything from when they're three or four. They can't remember till they were five or six. So that's one thing. The other thing that I would say is that it doesn't have to be a vivid memory that you remember every single detail. You um, you remember emotional. So your emotional memory develops earlier <clears throat> than your actual uh, literal memory. So you can you can feel feelings. 
So if you had if you had comforting, happy times when you were, you know, two or three years old, you can remember that, even if you don't remember the exact specific details, or vice versa. And in fact, studies have shown that traumatic memories are encoded deeper than neutral memories. So it absolutely makes sense to me that somebody who went through a traumatic experience could remember something. And it might not be very vivid, but they remember vaguely the feeling of being fearful, of not being loved, of loved, of not being supported, of being distressed and not being comforted in that state. Uh, yeah, so absolutely, I think it's very feasible. And, and the very fact that you have children who go through so you know, not even Beth Thomas, but in general, you have we know that children who are put up for adoption, who are abused at a very young age, six months, a year, a year and a half, have behavioral problems. That in itself, to me, proves that there must be some kind of you know emotional link to what they experience, because otherwise there's no logical reason why they would have behavioral problems compared to other mm. kids who were put up for adoption at the same kind of age. Yeah, I mean, I suppose there there are two 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 different avenues there. One is um trauma affecting you young, um, which is one thing, but then actually remembering, uh, for me, I do remember, uh, now I have gaps, but I do remember vividly, um, quite a, quite a bit of it, not the start, not the end. Um, but kind of the events surrounding those two days when it happened, I remember. And it was only when I brought, you know, these occurrences up to my mom that she sort of went, holy shit. I, I know what day you're talking about. And I, she, she had went to work that day. She was a pizza girl. She'd went to work and before she dropped me off at the babysitters, I think it was the second night that I stayed there. Um, the lady wanted to meet her on the road instead of at the house this time and sort of exchanged me over between cars. Um, and just as soon as she went to, you know, give me uh, or, or hand me over to the, to the babysitter, I, I was just, I lost it. And I remember this vividly, reaching out, grabbing for my mother, begging for her not to make me go. Um, and I'd never done that before. I was always very, very good with strangers and it just didn't sit well with my mother. So she went to work, um, couldn't shake the feeling. So she said to her boss, look, something, something's not right. I need to take off and go get my son. And the boss said, sure, no problem. And when she came to get me, the lady answered the door. Her name was Lynn. And she said, uh, what are you doing here? And my mom went, well, I'm off early. I came to get my son. And the lady said, well, you're not supposed to be here till, you know, 2 a.m. or whatever. And my mom went, well, I'm here now. So, you know, give me my fucking son. And uh, the lady said, well, you can't have him until later. And tried to close the door, but my mom just went mama bear mode and shoved past the woman, grabbed me. Uh, I'd been laying in a, a diaper or, or nappy, as you'd say in the UK that hadn't been changed and um she just rushed out of the place and it, and it turned and there was there were men in there partying and, st and stuff and seven months later the lady died of an od and i don't I, we don't know who the men were so um i i remember quite a bit of this some of it my mother told me but a lot of it i remember quite vividly so rochelle neve had talked about sp a specific instance where her mother had held Ricky over a bridge, threatening to drop him, and and the, and the scared her, or or had beaten her, or locked them in a room where there was piss and shit everywhere. Um, is it possible that we actually remember these things, or have we created some kind of memory based on our trauma? Yeah, I think it's definitely possible. Um, as I was saying before, different people have you got what's typical and then you've got people that are outliers so i think it's definitely possible i suppose it's hard to really know if how real the details are because our, our brain tends to confabulate so it tends to fill in gaps which we're not yes. sure about so you know i would say especially for something that's traumatic or emotional you're almost the the the, per, the person the victim almost certainly remembers the important bits of you know what actually physically happened with the abuse and they may or may not remember the surrounding bits particularly well. So they might misremember, <clears throat> you know, uh, exactly what the layout of the house was or exactly the words that were spoken, but, and they might fill in little gaps. But the thing is, it's really hard to know what is true and what's not, unless you have objective evidence, but the most important bit is remembered. Yeah. And I, well, yeah, oddly enough, that's exactly how it is for me. I mean, I do remember the layout of the house, but I, I don't remember the color or where the couch was, or, you know, I couldn't walk through it now if I wanted to. Um, and, and tell you where things were. But as you say, it's those traumatic events, uh, you know, um, 
I was I, I was made to go down on this babysitter, you know, as a two year old, and then uh, another guy did stuff to me, and there was another guy. But it, it it really is, as you say, it was those traumatic points that I remember. I, I don't remember much about the lead up. I remember a little about the lead up, but but a lot of a lot of a lot of that is is gone. So I suppose when Rochelle says that she remembers specifically her mother holding Ricky over the bridge, it's similar to what I experienced. So. Um, She's, and how old was Ricky at the time? Ricky would have been five, I think, five or six. So it was just before he, he died, you know. Uh, Rochelle would have been three. So, uh, and I was I was two, two and a half, I think. And, and, and I remember, I, I remember, there's no doubt about it. Uh, my mother didn't bring it up to me. I brought it up to her when I was 11 because I couldn't shake it. And I'd had these nightmares as well, too, that she told me about. Um, I couldn't wake up for them when I was young. Um, things I didn't even know I experienced, but yeah, it was a crazy conversation that day. Let's say in that situation, I lived with this, this babysitter and I was treated like this daily to the point that I thought this was normal behavior. At what point would the effects become irreversible? At what point would what was happening to me become something sexually that I would be that would be encoded in me like some kind of fetish? Because I've seen it a lot with 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 you know abuse victims that have you know maybe not got the treatment and then maybe went on to harm people themselves. They repeat what, what happened to them often. Like Luis Garavito was a perfect example. Yeah. So my answer to that, Justin, would be the same as my answer to a lot of psychiatric questions. I'm afraid, which is that it, it completely depends. It's so variable for different people. The best available research suggests that 75% or more of those who commit acts of sexual or physical abuse against others were themselves abused as children. However, the research also indicates that the vast majority of children who are sexually abused do not go on to abuse others. So some people have gone through very horrific abuse and have ended up surprisingly being very sort of emotionally resilient and having quite minimal psychiatric damage. Whereas some people have gone through, relatively speaking, uh, low levels of trauma and can be quite damaged. So I'll give you some specific examples for cases that I've seen. So <clears throat> as you know, I do criminal cases, but I also do civil cases, which means where somebody's suing somebody. And there was a man called John Styler, so J-O-N is his first name, Styler, and he was a Welsh headmaster. And he abused uh, a whole range of young schoolboys in the 1970s. Uh, and he ended. He got away with it, <clears throat> even though other teachers suspected what was going on. It's a whole different conversation. Uh, and he got moved between schools, and basically got away with it for for years. And then, when the allegations surfaced, when the men were older, he committed suicide. So he never got justice. But I was instructed by the solicitor's firm to carry out an assessment on these men. So I, I assessed quite a few of them. It's probably about eight or nine altogether. This was all about maybe three years ago now. So I saw them all within the space of a few weeks. And the abuse was very, very similar, like the grooming, <clears throat> the telling them that they were that, that they were special and giving getting them to come to their offices for these special lessons where you actually, you know, abuse them. And even the the type of the abuse was almost identical. I won't go through it all for your uh, for your viewers. Uh, but what really surprised me, even you know, doing all my training in psychiatry, was that the outcome was very different. So <clears throat> there was at least one person that I can think of. And this was, you know, just to be clear, this was prolonged abuse This for each individual victim. It wasn't just a one-off incident. It was something yeah. that happened for about two or three years, maybe up, up to several times per month. So at least one of the victims was relatively unscathed. I would say that I diagnosed him with dysthymia, which is just an unstable low mood, but not quite bad enough to be depression. But he was successful. You know, he had a family of, of his own. He had a couple of kids. He had quite a high flying corporate job. He was on a very good salary. To all intents and purposes, if you looked at him from the outside, you didn't know what he'd been through. You wouldn't have suspected that anything went on. Um, having said that, he was the exception. Most of the other cases had some form of anxiety or depression and some had post-traumatic stress disorder. So that is a, is a key diagnosis related to trauma. In fact, I've seen more cases of post-traumatic stress disorder far more than I have ever of reactive attachment disorder. I think for a couple of reasons, because reactive attachment disorder is usually diagnosed at a young age and people can grow out of it. So by the time that I see them as adults, it's often either not been, not been caught in the diagnosis or kind of is lost in the medical notes. Um, <clears throat> and also because post-traumatic stress disorder is usually 
when the event has happened later in life so people are more likely to remember it clearly so you know adolescence adulthood um yeah so i of the men that i assessed a, a huge proportion had anxiety depression a smaller proportion but significant had post-traumatic stress disorder so i suppose this is a, a rambling way to answer your question is that it's so varied so there will be some people that went through exactly the circumstances you're talking about of beth thomas who probably would be a little bit messed up in childhood but would be able to just because their emotion sort of um, emotional resilience will probably be able to I don't know what the term is, snap out of it, grow out of it, learn, uh, relearn their emotions out of it relatively easily, which mm. I think happened to Beth eventually. And there'll be other people who are completely damaged, who will be, uh, you know, could have everything from post-traumatic stress disorder to complex PTSD, to suicidality, to self-harm, to po possibly being uh, abusers themselves. There's just such a whole range of spectrum and it's so unpredictable that you can't say, there's no such thing as a typical case, I would say. I recently uh, interviewed uh, a famous forensic biologist named Dr. Mark Benecki, German guy, a uh, very interesting character. Um, we were talking about Luis Garavito, who had been abused badly as a child and went on to kill and torture uh, and rape three to four hundred boys, uh, plus hundreds of others that he would have just, you know, picked up in like a, an area where there would have been a lot of child prostitutes, child trafficking where he would have just, you know, taken those kids as well. Um, and one thing he mentioned was that once a, it appears via, you know, current studies that once something becomes ingrained in someone as a fetish, as they move on into, I guess, maybe it's later teens or early adult, uh, once it gets to that point, um, there hasn't really been any documented cases where people were able to change that. Now, Whatever that is, maybe you have a foot fetish, maybe you're into little kids, um, but he he was under the impression that uh, the given evidence at the at the moment states that this isn't something that has has not that it can't be changed, but that it's never really been seen to be changed. Yeah. So I'll tell you my thoughts about that. I suppose it's it's quite hard to measure because especially if you're talking about, you know, you said little kids, so, you know, people that, aff uh, that offend against children, you can never really know 100% if they're telling the truth because yeah. it's quite easy for somebody to say, I don't have those thoughts anymore, you know, if they're in prison and they've had this rehabilitation or even in one of my psychiatric units. So I would I would broadly agree that the thought process itself is unlikely to change, but that's not the important bit. The important bit is their behavior and whether they act on those impulses so <clears throat> i remember being asked in an interview quite recently about pedophilia so my, the question the interviewer asked was is pedophilia a mental illness uh, and my answer was potentially controversial is depends how well first of all it depends how you define a mental illness but it's not the fault of the person that has those thoughts because that is ingrained that is a fetish that is something that's that's come from their uh, that's developed during their puberty and during their adolescence, possibly in relation to abuse that they've suffered. But that's not the important bit. That's not actually what really matters. What matters is whether they act on those behaviours or not. And that absolutely can change. And that can change for a number of reasons. It could be that somebody themselves has an internal epiphany and you know feels a huge amount of guilt for what they've done before it could just be the pressure of society right so they've already been caught two or three times they've been in and out of the prison system probably been victimized probably rightly so some would say because they're because of the types of nature of their offenses so they want to turn their lives around not because they've developed more empathy or because they've uh, looked into the morality of their past behaviors but because they don't want to keep living their life like that so it's absolutely possible to change the behavior and i think that's the important bit more than the fetish Possibly. I mean, I guess you have to look at it and you have to ask yourself, um, is it worth the risk to other people? I mean, this is, this is always where you and I kind of go in, in separate ways, but it doesn't, it doesn't change the fact that uh, how much I can learn from what you have to say. And it really helps me see things from another side. Uh, but yeah, still I, I, I'm of the mindset and, and I suppose it, it's not coming from a medical background. It's coming from someone who's been through it, uh, uh, abuse specifically of a mother who has been through it way more than I have and her sisters. I think even my grandmother. Um, I've seen it a lot. So uh, I'm of the mindset that if you, if you've, if you've offended, if you've reoffended twice, meaning you've offended three times when it comes to kids, you don't get out. Um, yeah. you, you've proven that you cannot control those thoughts. Now it's different. Say someone who has these thoughts 
And they come forward and they go, I have these thoughts. I can't fucking stand it. I want to fix it. I haven't acted on them. I've never downloaded CP or anything like that. But I want to fucking stop this. I need help. Okay, I've got a lot more sympathy for someone like that. That's clearly some kind of um, sickness or disorder that, that is beyond their control. But they can control whether or not they go and get help. Um, yeah, yeah. And and I would agree with pretty much everything you said there. There's one one thing that I would add to that. If somebody, and I have met people like this, not very often, but I'd say probably one once once or twice a year, somebody like this comes across my uh, my radar. If somebody offends only during a mental illness so say if they've got severe bipolar affective disorder and they go into a manic phase so you might know this but when you suffer from mania then you're disinhibited you're very speeded up you make very impulsive actions uh, you can be uh, quite aggressive at times or you can your thoughts can be can be racing you can come up with lots of ideas and never finish them so in that context if they sexually offend then i would want to treat that Obviously, it's not just a case of giving them some tablets and saying goodbye to them. That it's far too risky. I would want to follow them up in the community. I'd want to see them on a regular basis. But I suppose what I'm saying is that's another situation for me. I don't know how you feel about this, Justin, where I think that somebody can be given another chance if they've got a mental illness, which we can treat. Um, I suppose the risk that we run there is um, tarring people with uh, bipolar disorder as uh, Potentially having a hood pass to Peter failure if they're in a manic state, and and I can't agree with that. Uh, but I understand where you're coming from. Um, I definitely understand where you come from, and I'm all for them being treated. Um, just not not released, <laughs> hung up by their necks. <laughs> No, um, and just to throw a spanner in the works, I just want to, to see what you think about this. So, you know, again, if we're talking about people who are intentionally evil people who have no remorse or don't care about offending uh, against children, then you and I are on the on the same wavelength. I, I don't think they should be given uh, uh, second or third chances. What about somebody that's got like a learning disability? So, somebody with, say, severe autism who has these sexual urges who doesn't really understand the impact of their actions? Would you? prefer for them to have a comfortable life but always in detention or do you think somebody like that should be given a chance at, at living not completely independently but saying supported accommodation but there's a risk that they could you know leave their accommodation and do something sexual again i think we run the risk of of tarring people with autism as potential uh having potential hood passes to 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 pedophilia um i understand a learning difficulty i think in that situation i would agree with your first statement that um, they, they need to be in a medical institution, uh, and, and, and comfortable. I mean, this, when you, when you go that deep into it, that it's, you know, but the, the question really is, 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 does that person understand, did they know what they were doing was wrong when they did it? And if they didn't, why didn't they? I mean, these are questions that I would have to answer. Um, I personally just can't advocate for letting a, um, offending pedophile back out ever. I just can't, I can't do it no matter what. Even if myself, maybe I got possessed by a demon for real, like honestly got possessed by a demon and went out and did something like that. Uh, and they exercised me and the demon was gone. Lock me up. Um, I think that pretty, pretty much along the lines of what we're saying, I think if somebody's a repeat offender shows no kind of remorse, shows no willing to change, then I think they're unsafe and they should be locked up. I think most people would agree with that. I think there is a grayer area in people who are less less responsible for their actions. So people with mental illnesses, learning disabilities. Uh, I, I just want to make the point that I mentioned people with, bi with bipolar and people with autism who've committed these kind of offenses. It is extremely rare. It just happens to be that as a forensic psychiatrist, that's exactly the kind of thing that I see because those are the cases that uh, uh, referred to me. So I don't want to, I don't want to add to the stigma of mental illness and say that most people uh, or, or even a significant proportion of people with those illnesses would go on to do that kind of offense. And, and that's what I agree. That That's what I agree with mostly. Yeah. Yeah. But I think, but in my God, I have literally seen people who have offended with a learning disability because they don't understand what sexuality, uh, what sexuality is, what consent is. They still have these urges. They, uh, people around them have boyfriends and girlfriends and partners. They want one and they don't know how to do it. So, you know, one man that I wrote about in my book went and sort of groped some random women. But when you spoke to him about it, he didn't understand the impact of his actions. So that's the gray area that's harder to deal with because, you know, 
I mean, there's a moral issue of locking somebody up for the rest of their lives, but also there's a, a, a resource issue as well. You know, there's only a, a limited number of hospital places. And you, if somebody has be, committed behaviour like that and then has been absolutely fine on the ward or in the uh, care home for, say, 5, 10, 15 years, then you, will it come to a point where you can say they're safe? And when is that point? It's, it's a very murky kind of grey area. It, it really is. And, and I think you even run... Uh run an even uh, bigger risk of, risk of creating more people who could potentially abuse by letting someone out that shouldn't be, um, which eats into those resources even more so. Um, I think where, where we probably could agree is that someone like you've just discussed or like you've, like you've just uh, described, uh, I wouldn't put them to prison. I wouldn't put because it's not punishment that they need. It's, uh, it, it is help. It is... I mean, if if you're talking about someone who's got the mentality of a child Beth Thomas's age, and really doesn't understand it, and maybe were abused as well, I mean, the, the, the you're right, there is a gray area there, uh, and they should be treated. But I, under no circumstance, would ever let them out. Uh, but that's just me. Um, <laughs> okay, so I <laughs> but, think um, we like the Charles common... Xavier of, of the debates, aren't we? Uh, Charles Xavier and Magneto, when we we'll politely agree to disagree. Yeah, 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 totally. Yeah. And and that's the thing about conversations with you that I, that I really enjoy uh, is, is that we can have a conversation um, and we can go different ways in different points. Uh, but I don't know about you, but I always learn something. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you on The Disturbing Truth again. Um, if you don't know, psych for sore eyes, Dr. Das, uh, he's my doctor. I have him on my phone. I text him whenever I can't sleep and I need you know, verbal cuddles. He's my guy. Um, just want to say thank you for having me on. I like talking about you, talking with you because you ask interesting questions and you're not, uh, you know, we we agree on a lot of things, but not on everything. And it, um, I'm always open to hearing other people's points of view because sometimes, even though sometimes I don't share your opinion, I can completely understand why you would think it. And, I, and that's not just with you. I think that's with uh, a lot of people that I have these kind of philosophical com conversations with. It was it was a pleasure to to, to hear your take on on Beth's story. Helped me a lot under, to, to understand uh, RAD. Um, it's something, I think you'll agree, that more parents should know about. It's something that matters. I mean, through discussing this case, as you know, I have a four-month-old little boy. Through discussing this case, it's even made me more careful about my facial expressions around my baby. I'm smiling every time I see him. I'm giving him love. I'm giving him care. I'm giving him as much as I can, you know. Um, crazy, crazy to think what what the littlest babies can actually pick up just on you know tone, expression, everything that you've just been talking about. Yeah, yeah, and specifically, um, a, a mother's facial expression expression is so important to a child. I mean, it's way more important than a than a father's, and a mother's uh, being in the child's life is way more important. Even though, from from what I've been told from another from another professional is that if you take either one of those structure what structures away mother or father the whole thing it, it it just wants to collapse but by far a mother it, it seems to be more important you know so little things like that and that plays into Beth's case as well uh, because her mother passed away when she was one and she was left in the care of just her evil father um, it's a horrible horrible man awful awful um, but yes again. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to see you. Let's do it again, man. Okay, let's do it. Thank you, Justin. Peace, Peace out, All the brother. best, sir. See you.